Hello, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled My Comments on the Thunderbird T-38 Crash at Indian Springs, January 18, 1982. I think the commander was unfairly maligned during the accident report. I think, in my opinion, he had a one-in-a-million failure that was just at the absolutely wrong time, and there were a lot of events that led to the situation occurring as it did without him calling for a breakout and probably without him fully realizing until it was simply too late that um, things were just not going to work out on this maneuver. Now, a little bit of history. Just before this, on September 8th, 1981, the previous Thunderbird commander, Lieutenant Colonel David Smith, was taking off from Burke Lakefront Airport. I, rem I remember this accident well. Um, I had just gotten out of the Air Force in 1979, and I had been the T-38 Senior Flight Examiner at the Flight Test Center, and I'd been working with Major Pete. There had been some issues with landing accidents with the Thunderbirds, and uh, Major Pete was in charge of uh, teaching some specialized landing techniques to the Thunderbirds, and uh, he was going to be leaving, so he was training me to take over this position. Unfortunately, uh, I ended up getting out of the Air Force, so that never developed. But in the process, I got to see um, this landing technique and practiced it, and also got to see some of uh, the maneuvers. Now, in this accident, um, when they were taking off from um, uh, Burke Lakefront, they ingested some... Uh, seagulls. It took out both engines, they were at low altitude, and uh, ejection was commanded. Now, the T-38 does not have commanded ejection. What happened most likely was that um, Colonel Smith uh, instructed his back seater uh, to punch out, and his back seater was the, uh, the, the crew chief, uh, Staff Sergeant Dwight Roberts. Um, he most likely told him to punch out because the front seater uh, is the second one to go. If he goes first and the back seater goes at the same time, the back seater is going to get a face full of canopy and it'll probably be fatal. So the back seater has to go first. So the back seater goes, but there's a delay. So the front seater has to make sure the back seater gets out before he can uh, successfully punch out. Unfortunately, that put the ejection at too low of an altitude. Um, Colonel Smith's chute did not open, and he was uh, killed uh, impacting some uh, rocks on the uh, the lakeshore there right at Burke Lakefront Airport. Very unfortunate accident. Well, Major Lowry had already been selected to take over as Thunderbird lead in the following season, and um, that's what he did. So he uh, brought the team back together. Now, this is a diamond loop. The accident was described as a diamond crash, but it really wasn't a diamond crash. It was a line of breast maneuver. And normally when you fly a loop in the T-38, uh, as, as a student, you start at a uh, 10,000 foot base. You enter at 500 knots, full military power. It's about a 10,000 foot loop with a, with a 6G initial pull. It's not really obviously a good air show loop because first of all you're 10,000 feet so they started at 100 feet and I got to see this um, with Major Pete and uh, as a student doing a loop at 500 knots coming down the backside at uh, about 15,000 feet coming down was pretty scary even though you're high above the ground doing it at these low altitudes really gets your attention you, you've just got a lot of ground all around uh, and there's to me very few things more difficult than flying formation, line abreast. You've got your head about 90 degrees. You're flying sideways. You talk about tumbling your inner ear. It's been bad enough when I was flying formation, uh, especially if you were in the weather where your, your senses were getting a little scrambled, that uh, I, I would encounter serious spatial disorientation. You had to put the wingtip in the star and keep it there and fight for it. Uh, until it subsided, and it, it usually did. But I remember you're concentrating on your position. 
The first time I ever flew on the wing during an aileron roll, um, I was halfway through the aileron roll. I was inverted. I was holding position. I'm halfway through the aileron roll upside down when I happened to notice that the brown side is above me and the back seater was kind of chuckling because until that point I hadn't realized we we're in an aileron roll. You're just holding position and the, the controls and the position stay the same um, as long as you're in positive 1G. So uh, for the wingman not to realize um, in their peripheral vision that they were in trouble, I don't fault them for that because it's scary enough as it is and you are concentrating on position. You can't really, I mean, you're not bringing your head back in the two and a half second delay to read instruments. You, you don't do that when you're flying formation. You are concentrating on what you're doing. So by the time they would have possibly realized it, and there's an interesting part in the accident report that doesn't make sense to me, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a second. But I want to talk about the flight control system in the T-38. Now, this isn't one of your frontline fighters with modern uh, fly-by-wire flight control systems. This is a basic um, a hydraulic, uh, and I'll read what it says in the dash one. A hydraulically powered irreversible flight control system is provided. In parentheses, air loads on the control surfaces cannot cause, this, cannot cause control stick or surface movement. Conventional aerodynamic feel, in quotations, in the control stick is provided artificially by springs and bob weights. The springs progressively resist control stick displacement and the bob weight mechanism further restricts aft stick travel during maneuvering flight. The, the bob weights are supposed to uh, dampen out um, aggressive stick maneuvering. Now, irreversible flight control system. All right. That means that it's, it's not like a Cessna 150 where you can feel the air loads. Now, this thing goes from zero to uh, over 700 knots. So there's a lot of change in air loads and you could not possibly mechanically, of course, move the flight control. So you have to have hydraulic assist. And the thing is on an irreversible flight control system is you don't know what the elevator is doing. You pull the stick back and you expect it to move a certain amount. Now on a modern fly-by-wire flight control system, if there's a malfunction in the actuator, you're going to get a warning right away. Uh, there is no warning on this if your actuator uh, fails to respond or freezes, other than if you would have like hydraulic failure and that's why it didn't move. But if the actuator just simply freezes, you don't know it. You can pull that stick, push it, all sorts of things, and there's no indication to you that anything at all is wrong. And that, in my opinion, uh, and also in the accident report, uh, led to um, a, lot, a lot of the problems. All right, here's my crude graphic of the loop. I've got several points I, I want to discuss here, A, B, C, D, and E. Now, um, like I said, when we practiced it, it was 380 knots entry point. The accident report said they entered it 391. Okay, that's certainly in the ballpark for what we're talking about here. Now, you start the formation up in the loop and it requires you to come in with back pressure. That gets the nose turning. And, of course, you're decreasing airspeed all the way around, so back pressure has to increase to keep the pitch rate going. So let's say you start in with the pitch rate. You're doing 391 knots. You're right above the ground here at 100 feet. You start in, and now the, sta the uh, stab uh, actuator fails. Well, you can't increase the back pressure, so you're going to start to go up here, and then the nose is going to drop off, and you're going to start coming back down. It's going to be pretty obvious that something's wrong, uh, you're going to tell the formation to break out. You're going to try to address your situation. You're going to quickly realize that um, you got a flight control problem because it's not responding. You're going up, so that's not so bad. So you can uh, command an ejection in a reasonably controlled fashion, and situation goes fine. Well, it didn't happen there. They don't say in the accident report where it happened, but it's pretty obvious from what's going on. It did not happen at point A. So now they're coming up. 90 degree up point, which is just past point uh, B here. And they're doing um, uh, 290 knots, 3,400 feet. That all makes sense. Well, now to keep the loop coming around, you have to keep back pressure. If the 
actuator failed at B, you just kind of head on off again, uh, climbing into the distance. Um, the pitch rate would decrease as airspeed decreases, and you would see that there was something wrong. Plenty of time to tell everybody to break out and deal it with yourself. Well, apparently it didn't happen there because he kept uh, pulling through the loop, and we get up here at the top. Now, you have to float as in any loop. You get to the point where you're running out of airspeed and you have to float the aircraft over the top. It said it came over at 139 knots, which is awfully slow for a T-38. Awfully slow. So he's really floating it over the top at 6,700 feet. All right. Um, so now you got to start pulling in the back pressure. And you're going to start coming down. Now you're at point D. Um, you're bringing in a bit of back pressure, but your airspeed's low. So you're, you're getting a good pitch rate. But you got to keep increasing the back pressure to keep the loop coming around. So he's coming down and at uh, um, he's 90 degree down at 3,600 feet, doing 310 knots. Well, 290 going up, 310 coming back. That's still in that's still in the ballpark. You don't you know do these maneuvers perfectly. Sometimes you float too much. Sometimes you don't float enough. They were practicing for the season, so everybody's learning. So you know, give them 10, 20 knots easily. Uh, you can't, uh, can't fault them for that. So now they're coming down. Um, they're going straight down at 3,600 feet, 310 knots. That's all reasonable. And a second later, he's going through 1,100 feet above the ground, 50 degrees down at 405 knots. Now you've gotten a little fast here. Okay. So he's, he's probably up there thinking, well, I didn't pull enough back pressure. It's getting a little fast. I think this is about the time somewhere uh, coming up between point D and E that the actuator failed. Now, as the aircraft speeds up, you can have a failed actuator. As, as the aircraft speeds up, the pitch rate is going to increase, the G is going to increase, and it's going to look like things are working. But they're not working as well as you want them to. But it's going to look like they're working. See, that, that's the gotcha. That's where it failed at the wrong time. He's going downhill. It looks like it's working. But he's going, okay, I'm a little fast on the airspeed, so I'll pull a little more back pressure. And of course, they're Thunderbirds, they're smooth. You, you've got to fly smoothly in a formation, but he's coming back in and he's coming in more and more. And this is happening very fast. It's only a few seconds between when this actuator would have failed and when they hit the ground. So he's coming down. He's, he's at a 45 degree uh, bank. He's at uh, 670 feet and he's probably going things aren't looking right at it the accident report says at 413 feet he pulled the throttles to idle now that to me doesn't make sense because if you're at a high power setting and you pull the power to idle everybody's all your wingmen are going to be by you in a shot uh, you just left them behind uh, and they would know at that point uh to, to break out of the maneuver and they would increase the G and they, they could have probably successfully recovered at that point. But, um, that's why I kind of contested. He really pull a title at 30 degrees nose down. He's doing 424 knots. So by now he probably realizes he's in trouble at 281 feet. He's in a 26 uh, degree dive and he hits the ground and it says he hits tail first, which is kind of interesting at 415 knots. Well, he entered at 391, 415 knots isn't that much uh, faster. If he had had the failure at point D, for example, he would have hit the ground at over 500 knots. He'd have been smoking. Um, so it seems like the actuator failed very late. It failed in an insidious way. Because as the aircraft's accelerating, the pitch rate's increasing, the nose is responding, um, and it just failed at the worst possible time in the maneuver. So I think he should be given a little more credit. It first came out as pilot error. Of course, they always slap that on everything. And then it came out as actuator failure. But I think, uh, and, and the question was, well, they were just maintaining formation integrity. Well, nobody's going to follow a leader into the ground if you know that he's going into the ground. Um, but given the sight picture, and how scary it looks that low anyway, I don't think the wingman realized till way too late um, what had happened. But anyway, 
that's my take on this maneuver. I think he's gotten a, a little disparaged uh, as far as um, the lead's involvement in this accident. I think he was set up, put in a very bad situation, and it would have happened to anybody virtually no matter the experience because it just uh, the malfunction just happened too late. Anyway, thanks for listening.